names that I generate associate uh, with uh, ICL and its technical development. Our thanks to Virginio Pasquale, where is he? Uh, who's put the program uh, together. I would ask you to sign the attendance sheets. Uh, we do invite people to join the uh, Computer Conservation Society. This is, I think, perhaps not entirely a typical uh, event, but then no events of the Society are, are typical. But they are certainly all fascinating to those of us who are interested in the, the history of our great subject. We need volunteers to join the committee, and uh, in all seriousness, I would ask you to contact me or any member of the uh, uh, committee uh, if you do feel that you've got a little time to spare uh, for us. Now, lunch, as you probably gathered, is available immediately uh, outside, but I'll leave it to Arthur Humphreys to set the program out. I suspect to the great majority of you, Arthur Humphreys needs no introduction whatsoever. Uh, to me, famous as the man who was the managing director at the time of the merger in 1968, uh, and who, as it were, set the 1900 series uh, on its path. Over to Arthur. Thank you. 
been any, but in any event, the benefits it brought to, to BGM were of marginal advantage. <laughs> you have access to all their patents and know how. You can buy any of their products at 10% of their cost. And certainly in his view, said Nuffdor, it was not worth the royalty payments of 25%. Someone, however, pointed out there was a further advantage not mentioned. Harold said Nuffdor. What was that? It was that the BGM did not have IBM as a competitor. I wonder who that was. <laughs> and so the BGM was on its own, and as it happened about the same time, in October 49, while some of BGM's only uh, competitive punch cards terminated its licensing agreement with Remington Rand. <coughs> and so also it was on its own for the fully owned subsidiary of Pickers. In the early to late 1950s, BGM and Powers had loose arrangements with UK computer companies, supplying them with an output equipment to them and seeking possible bases of further collaboration. In 1954, BGM made specific arrangements with GEC jointly to develop the 1301 computers, which GEC would manufacture and BGM would sell. Powers had a loose arrangement with Ferenti with a project or product called Pluto. In June 1958, the merger of BGM and Powers was announced, and the new company, ICT, which was Cecil Wheeler's chairman and Cecil Wheeler's managing director, was launched in January 1959. At the outset, ICT operated essentially as a punch card company with electronic extensions. BGM had been successful in its range of electronic multipliers and calculators, and Powers with its electronic multiplier punch game but its two main products, the Samasonic Tabulator and Program Control Tabulator, were not successful, and the lack of which, the lack of which caused many problems for the new company. <coughs> Be that as it may, Cecil B formulated a strategy of consolidating all British computer companies or interests into ICT. In the autumn of 1959, ICT first sought to make a specific arrangement with Ferranti, but Ferranti chose not to accept the recommendations of a joint working party each company had set up, and so the eventual partnership was delayed until 1963. In 1961, the arrangements with GEC were changed. GEC backed out of the development of the 1301, but remained responsible for its manufacture. ICT engineering was set up, embracing the GEC development product planning group, GEC taking a 10 percent interest. At that time, Arnold was not, was not too keen on uh, computers, uh, Mr. Weinstock invited Peter and I to come and have lunch with him, and he said, oh, you've come to talk about computers, that you offer. Well, we in the GC know absolutely nothing about it at all. And I've just paid 50,000 pennies for CEIR to discover they know less than we do. <coughs> <coughs> in 1966, when talks with the took place, English Electric postulating that had ICT sales force would secure more orders for their KDF 9 and 8. These talks were overtaken by a proposal from RCA, the whom English Electric had a very long standing technical agreement, that a three way arrangement should be made to tackle the European market for computers. RCA developed a strategy of heavy investment in the computer business. It judged rightly that it was of more significance than color television. RCA had introduced to the American market the 501 and 301 models in a compatible range to be followed at the top of the 601 and the bottom of the 201. Each electric were marked in the 501 as KDP 10. The possibility of such collaboration seemed to ICT worth taking seriously, but each electric did not think so at that time, and so it ended the three way discussions. However, ICT entered into a technical agreement with RCA, as did the Paul Company in France. ICT also purchased RCA 301 computers and marketed them as uh, 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 ICT 1500s. The technical agreement with RCA provided scope for collaboration in developments and product plans for the future. In 1961-63, there were many talks with the Bull Company to examine possibilities for collaboration in a sort of computer common market. These talks collapsed when Bull, having decided on a strategy of growth irrespective of profitability, found that this did not work, always went bust, and in 1964 were acquired by German Electric of America, and ICT at that time was also copied by GM. In 1962, three significant events occurred. One, ICT acquired the computer interest of EMI and the 1100 and 2400 products, as well as customers and a bright and small team of hardware, software, and sales staff. Two, an agreement was concluded with Unibet in the United States to purchase.
purchase and sell at ten oh four in ICT's markets, and I'll refer to this until they want. Three in the launch at last as a thirty to one computer and its introduction to the market. Now ICT's product planning group had the formidable task of formulating product plans and seeking to specify products, taking account of the views and working hands of EMI and RCA engineers, product planners and plans, and of course the views of its own technical and sales staff. About mid-March 1963, I was told to visit Randy Packard in, in Japan to look at the FP6000 and to take appropriate colleagues with me and to make the necessary arrangements with Peter Hall. Peter Hall had been a key figure of persuading for Randy to merge its computer division into ICT by using immaculately the determined pressure and as a result, serious talks have been underway for some time since January. Accordingly, I set out with my colleague, Echo Organ, the head of ICT Engineering Production, and Tom Shepard from Product Planning, and with Peter Hall as his government. We travelled to Canada via New York, where I was introduced to the Cameron McMahon's bar, where the twist was embedded, and later I invested in interest and introduced them to another twist called Lion Dice. <laughs> the presentation of the FBC Garden by the Randy Packard staff was expertly done, and Echo and John and I were very impressed with the specification, and during the several days of our stay, very impressed also with the possibilities of enhancement into a compatible range. Echo returned home, and Thomas Shepard and I went to see RCA at Cherry Hill, and were brought up to date with their plans and problems. It was Good Friday. Returning to the UK, Tom and I met with Cecil Mead, on Easter Monday, and I, and I recommended the adoption of the FP6000 and the drop of our own developments, assuming that a deal with Ferranti would be brought off. Now here's the crunch. Social Mead said, if that's what you think, let's do it. This turned out to be a two billion pound decision. Work and collaboration continued from then alongside the negotiations for the sale by Ferranti to ICT and its computer division, and the deal was presented to ICT shareholders at an EGM at the end of September 1963. At the meeting, it seemed no one had any questions, but a 16-year-old man with a helmet in his hand and 10 shares, I think, said to the chairman, you've clearly played too much of the business, so when are you going to sign? <laughs> However, the shareholders approved the deal. So for the rest of 1963 and into 1974, ICT, now strengthened with Ferranti computer staff, proceeded with the development of the 1900 range and to put it into manufacturing. In early April, Battle Ferranti, Pete Hall, and I were in the States for talks with RCA University and others. Peter and I were invited by RCA to attend a presentation to be made by IBM's message for RCA as one of their important customers. Peter and I introduced ourselves to IBM staff. And this is what was revealed. It was the 360. Peter and I adjourned the RCA top management and product planning staff to review the situation. It was April the 7th. We decided the announcement did not affect, the RCA decided the, the announcement of the 360 did not adversely affect the other hands, and we recognized we were committed to the 1900 and could not change anything. Thereafter, the rest of the summer presented a formidable task and challenge to the company, and particularly its sales force. Against all the announced promises of all that goodies in the 360, we were not in a position formally to launch the 1900 series, and the press unkindly but accurately pointed out that ICT was seeking to sell 1301s, 1500s, 1100s, 2400s, Orions, and Atlas, and described this as the largest track bag of incompatible computers that was possible to imagine. <laughs> However, in September, we were signing with efficiency business efficiency exhibition, the 1900 series was announced in quite a special manner, and the 1902 and 1904 models were at the exhibition and available for customers to see and touch. The announcement itself Thank you. 
electric computers and the new generations, bits and bytes to be or not to be compatible with IBM, the promise of a golden blood by the government wishing to face up to the challenge of the white heat of the technological revolution and urging the murder of power to place the orders promised and the golden rod gave more pain than cash. So much for the background and all the intertwining issues that led to the 1900 and the immediate steps and aftermath of it. All the intertwining threads, all the companies that were involved, all the ideas and all the plans, temporary, idealistic, were all put in one pot. But at least the issue was resolved by the decision to adopt the FP6000. Now, Peter Gates will no doubt cover in more detail the actual plans and projects, which in the crucial years of 1959 to 1964 were open to the company. And I'm sure my other colleagues will enjoy making their presentations in line with the agenda. Thank you very much.
put an LBR or a, a, a laser beam which gave the blips on the glass and the process, if you think about what we're trying to do, was almost exactly the same as a CD-ROM is now. And there were people at the time who were saying, if you're going to copy RCA and then you're going to copy IBM, then you, you're never ever going to be able to deal with um, competing with IBM because of their enormous production volumes. So you had to leapfrog. So this was one of the leapfrog type benches. Well, you could do this just like Parenti had done years before with Atlas, then that was the way to go. All those things had to be dealt with and kindly or otherwise uh, investigated. I don't actually uh, want to list all this lot, but we did in fact have 27 peripheral units and we got all the things to think about, so interfacing them and buffering them, and uh, another lot were the um, the tape formats, it's been written about several times, the fact that we had 18 different tape formats, it wasn't possible to take any one and go to another one. And we didn't have any universal tape converters and so on to deal with. So ranges um, looked a bit further, far away, although from November 1961, when the technical agreement was made with RCA, we envisaged the thought of being able to do that. So that was always the Valhalla that was to, to be achieved, but somehow or another, that, along the way, uh, there was always something that stopped it. Now, I had gone through this lot with Arthur, and he said, when all things are floating, you're never going to be able to make a decision, ever. So you've got to knock some pegs in the ground, which was what he called it, and he's mentioned to you one of the pegs that he knocked in the ground, and I bring it out again for a particular reason. The 1004 agreement <coughs> gave us those things, but rather critically, it gave us a margin that after we paid for it from, from uh, Univac, it gave us a margin of 12 million pounds. And that was over a period of about three years. So that gives me the, um, the cue to show what our uh, uh, company position was in terms of uh, financing. I should just say, by the way, that Univac had arranged for us to meet on the third floor of a uh, New York hotel, the Carlisle. And I'd gone down from the third floor to the second floor, usually with the bucket to get me ice, not for Arthur, but for Dr. Rayner, who is the um, president. And when I got down onto that second floor, there was uh, four or five chaps that looked like all American full, fullbacks, all in nice gray suits. What are you doing down here? And they escorted me very kindly, but very firmly, up onto the second floor. Well, in fact, President Kennedy had set his headquarters up there, and he was just about to say two Khrushchev's ships that had got the mid-range missiles coming across the Atlantic um, will attack you unless you turn around. So all the world really was uh, looking in on what was going to happen with this lot. And in the meantime, this was the agreement that Arthur was busy getting on the 10 or 4. And an absolutely magnificent agreement. <laughs> Especially when you consider it in context with the ICT financials at that time. Here we were talking about a 12 million pounds increase, essentially, down that um, second column, the profit before tax, because all we had to pay out of that was our selling costs, and even our training costs we were going to recover by charging for training. The line down the bottom indicated it was a bellwether of the position we were getting into, because we were at that time spending uh, 2.4 million, what I had done in 1963, but the running rate of the projects that were in hand was something like three and a half million. So we were looking for a four million pound future spend, and we had 
the 1300s that we couldn't make enough of, so we were making 1500s. So let's now change place altogether and have a look, really, at some of the other things that we were wanting to use to decide how we could fill in that product range. Well, going back a little bit to 1962, RCA had carried out one of the first telephone surveys of what people were doing with the computers. They had, they had 4,000 installations, and because of their telecoms experience, in between the telephone operators at the time taking calls, they were in fact carrying out their telephone surveys. So we had a great deal of information uh, about the way that computers were being used, the relationship between computers that were used on for scientific purposes and for commercial purposes. In powers, and because of my background, which was as, as a, a chartered insurer, and also I was part way through um, qualifying as an actuary, my job in, in powers was to look after the uh, insurance companies, which essentially would all have huge files. By huge files, I would mean the Prudential had 50 million policies, everyone represented by a card. The Pearl was 22 million, the Refuge Assurance was about 13 million, and so on, around uh, the UK. And this also covered into France, where we had 15 of the département in the um, Credit Agricole, where our users, and they had somewhat similar, these very large, uh, card files, and we were seeking to avoid always having to sort them because of the enormous time and, and embuggerance factors that would come with doing that. And as we went into the calculator business, the same thing was happening on the work in progress files in manufacturing <coughs> companies. And Paris had uh, Gold Systems and Reports Department, so all the sales proposals had to be vetted. And those large uh, systems, it was my job to go through them and say, uh, why can't we do it a bit uh, in a slightly different way, or rearrange the data, or it won't work, whatever. Polarith also had a similar department, and that had been formed mostly to deal with the 1201s and 1202s. I cannot mention very much, but there was 160 of these installations, which were full-blown uh, computer installations. And somewhat uh, about a year after that manager of those two times, I was also put in charge of that. So I was seeing all the time how we were actually using our equipment. And I was keeping records of them, of trying to get the essence of what was special about them and putting that down, uh, really, I suppose, to help me in looking at the next ones. When the 1500s were bought, the RCA 301, this was a, about a 10 million pound order, and I was given the job in a week of turning, we bought 100 systems into, we want so many 10K stores, so many 20, so many 40, so many of this sort of tape, this sort of printer, and also uh, uh, so many of the, the possibility of a race random access device. So again, this was <coughs> try and forward estimate from the point of view of RCA using it in their production planning, how much we wanted of each of these pieces. And what they were seeking to do, because clearly we could not be running the actual application on a trial machine, because we didn't have a trial machine if we were thinking of a new one, but we were looking to do some benchmarking. Probably the biggest benchmark that we put together at that time was an invoice statement uh, shipped to mill two, uh, stock used in the invoicing, replacement of the stock, 
hence the bill of materials that came with the with the breakdown of whatever the product had been sold. Then the comparison through the bill of materials of saying, here's all the bits that make that product, how many have we got, therefore how many do we want to make up the new sets? And we turn that into a series of iterations, if you like, on the different parts of it, to be able to test some of the designs. And I shall come back to that in a moment. But this whole process, which had been going on as far as I personally was concerned, for a period of about um, 12 years, so I went to uh, Samus in 1952, and through that whole period I've been doing this sort of looking at systems and appraisals, and particularly the larger ones. And in parallel to that, I found that if you ask salespeople how many they were going to um, sell of any product, then uh, you really needed to have some way of, of checking it out if you like, if you're going to put it in, in the model. And uh, there wasn't at that time any sales process, sales system, which would record contacts, prospects, how many, how many proposals you're going to put in, what are your success rates going to be on all these, how long will it take to install it, and then how long is it before you can enhance the product. And you put down a few lead times on these, and I would ask the sales managers to give me just a few, while thinking about something else, how many of these do you have, and how many of these do you have? And then, when we would get any one of these estimates by itself, we would be able to work it both backwards and forwards and see whether 100 orders there really did match how many contacts they actually had at this time. So it gave a way of getting some credence into some forecasting which we frankly had not had. And I combined that with the appreciation and the knowledge which we put together through looking at all the uh, systems. I, I heard about VisiCalc, I hadn't ever seen a VisiCalc uh, spreadsheet, and in fact I asked uh, Fred Dernley, who worked in, in uh, planning and was a systems programmer, if he would prepare me, if you like, a, a project model. And the model would take all these inputs, including the inputs to do with benchmarking, including the inputs to do with the relationship between contacts through install, through installation time, through when you're going to get paid. It included the ability to deal with machines that were rented, and therefore it was going to be oh, three years before we could possibly see even getting our original money back because of the rental uh, uh, implications. And now I come to some work that has been jointly done and with other people involved, uh, with Derek Eldridge and um, Dr. Bird, for something that would fit below the FP6000. The model would take a great has of these, and it would fish out from them, first of all, single statements, which are at the top. And so this was the project file 182, and it was running number seven that they'd been working on, and it in fact had been done just a month before we were in the States. And it was the um, 1902 part, what I was trying to seeking to establish was where would you put a split between 1902 and 1903, uh, what kind of peripherals would go with that kind of a specification, how much was it going to cost us, and you can see some of the costs down there, which are the ones, ones out, 
all those came in as averages. Some of those were put in on individual lines relating to the individual parts of a number of different configurations which we expected to sell, but all in that category somewhere in 1902, 1903, or some area that would be below the FB6000. I'm jumping the gun a little bit to say 1902-3, we hadn't thought about any of those numbers at the time that this was being done, just, just like that. And you can see that uh, the development was going to cost us £770,000 for those units, and it wasn't until 1967-68 that the peak outflow of money was required. Now you see this some of the significances of the original set of figures I put down as to the long-term nature of the planning process in a company such as ours. And the amount of capital that would then have to be invested, I mean, it looks enormous. It was because of, uh, significantly because of the financing of the rentals. And we also had a profitability index. Now, that index was not a specific thing like saying uh, that will be the return on capital or the uh, net before tax on capital used in the business. It was a, a, a one measure, but which if you carried out the work in the same way, it would say this one looks better than that, and then you could investigate why. And the main reason why I first got that model put together was not really to do the arithmetic, because they did have people who would do it. Uh, to begin with, they would be very, very interested, incidentally. The people who you could trust to do it properly, because it was very important that you got the right answers, and were the people who, after having done three of them, would just get plain bored in doing it. And what I didn't appreciate was that they would improve what they were doing. And they really were probably improvements. But then, when you got an improved thing that had got some new rule in it that you didn't know quite what the implications were, or it changed something you had got, when you looked then at a previous one and looked at the index to see whether just what they looked like, because you were doing a different sort of what if, or you got some different information, you couldn't make the comparison. And so, really, my main starting reason of having the computer program was to get a consistent way to be able to do all those comparisons. Well, the next thing we did was to uh, do something which in spreadsheet terms wasn't in fact done generally by the, all the various spreadsheets, which was to add these things in a 3D way down. So you've got project number one with all the, um, the X's and Y's along there, and then you add them down and you get project one as project two. And if you go on long enough, you're going to get all the projects. And if you put an estimate in as to the other things, the, the things which gave rise to where you are now, the sum of that lot should equal what your company accounts were. Because the company accounts for us in 1964 were still struggling with putting together the horror of the power's accounting systems. And they thought absolutely in terms of a one-shot look, a snapshot, a balance sheet's a snapshot at a point in time, whereas projects, as you can see by these sort of timescales, go over a period of time. And that is exactly how you value uh, life policies in an insurance company. You're paying for ages and ages and ages, and the money's being accumulated, you're going to get it back, and all kinds of different probabilities of it happening along the way. So the one way of looking at that lot is to say, we'll take the present value of all those transactions, and that will correspond to something like this. So this process had given us, and actually as I was in um, the US in April 64, assisting Arthur with his supply of big pegs that he was busily knocking in the ground saying, it's FB6000, I've watched more, we're going to make a range out of it, now get to it. I had already <coughs> like something like a, a series of the way AA used to put their roadmap, roadmaps together. You don't go from London to Birmingham, you go to London and, and you figure out how you go from London to Enfield or whatever. And you put these things, pull these things out of the rack, put them all together, and you've got the total route. Well, we had got 
many, many of these projects that had been done, and they'd all been done, as it were, for, for real. They hadn't been done in a theoretical sense. There had been something that engineers were working on, companies were working on, people were wanting to buy, sales were working on sales forecasts. And we put all those together and had, had this waiting in the wings. The next stage on that, incidentally, was that I put into that Caldwell Grill, it was a it was a a company model in today's words, but it was the addition not only to what we had there, but to put in administration, the cost of financing, and the type of transaction that went with computer leases, which added twenty-four million pounds of facility to the to the company. Now I'm not I can't, I can't exactly recollect how this came about, but I had been talking <coughs> to Cecil Mead about saying, I wonder how IBM do this. And somehow or another it had come it had come about that Sir Cecil talked to I, th I think one of the two younger Mr. Watsons. And they said, well, why didn't you come over? In fact, I went to Poughkeepsie, which was where the corporate galactic headquarters is of IBM in the middle of 1963. And I had all this information and the programs and the, all the printouts that went with it. And I spent, um, we turned up, I was going for a morning originally, but they said, having described the methods we were using, why we were doing it, and I was quite open about it. I thought it, it's ridiculous to start putting in code numbers and things in here because what possible difference can it make to IBM if you're realistic about it when they spend as much as re on, on research as, uh, as our total business was about completely. And it was a rather, it was indeed at that stage a bit more than that amount of money. So our two or three percent at the time was really not going to make too much difference to them. So I described this, and they then said they were likely to do the same thing um, in the afternoon. They've got people to go, it was something like four o'clock, and we went on into the, into the evening. And they, on their part, their part incidentally, let me have how they went about doing the same process. It was uh, comforting in some ways. It was enough to make us want to continue with that process. So, still April 64, but it did have, and it wasn't all done just on the, as it were, on the back of an envelope to say, this is how we're going to do the process and the following day describe it all to ICI. There was one thing that I wanted more, more commentary about it, but this was engineering input. Was it, was it realistic to say that using FP6000 circuits, that it was going to be possible to get something compatible, but which could be at a cost? And you can see, had costs because the costs were going to support the sale price and the margin and that would be consistent with the selling costs we had at the time in the UK which were just short of 10% and it was 21% um, overseas at that time. So this sort of process did put some limits on the, uh, what the engineers could design and that tends to be my definition of engineer. Anybody not got Keith Robinson type devices. What you need is the man that does it for the right kind of cost that then becomes um, saleable. So I was looking for that that comfort factor of being able to write a specification which didn't say how you do it, but that it at least it at least looked as though it should be possible. And Derek Eldridge was with the team, and we went up on a coach, and Dickie Bird as well. And one way or another, they were, as I understood it at the time, were top grade circuit men. Not 
all these other things, but whatever other things they had, that was the one that I was interested in. And he said, yes, they thought it had been feasible, and in fact, we'd already had some discussions, and that, no doubt they were uh, talking about those things. I had phoned home because on that evening, because I knew we had a, you know, a game at home, and I think it was called Latax, which you had holders into which you put vertical cards so that you saw a black card when you were looking at the problems player and he saw something on the other side. And I asked if we could get a set of those and I had them sent up and all these cards were produced by chopping out little bits from our brochures. So when I got to um, Patney the next morning, I assembled all these things and was able to describe to the people from uh, ICA, ICI Billingham and uh, Hexagon House and the, there was a whole lot of central one. So starting with a small specification and saying, there's the central processor, here's the peripheral that goes with it, there's the peripheral that goes with that, and here's the comms box that goes there, so that if you want to, then you can put another one alongside it. And that general method of, of uh, display was adopted, <coughs> improved very considerably when uh, Tony Jay recommended how, how the product would be launched. It was launched with, with, with blocks with nothing on them really, but just the fact that you could fit them together in all different kinds of way. And so we had uh, worked out 1904, which was the FP6000, and 1905, which was going to be the scientific end of it, and 1902 and 3, and because of the background of sales of the different parts of it, because this is a very critical area as to where to put those sort of um, divisions, I think I described those and completed it going, going back on the Aeroplane for the two and three, and then the inevitable top cover, 1906 and seven, and how might, how that might grow. So the thing we had at the very beginning, which was 30 odd processors, we really looked as though we were going to be able to bring it down to something manageable. The company model told me something about the estimates of money. It certainly told us that we. We were going to be two or three million pounds per year short on development. And I'm not sure it's going to be covered, but one of the enormously important things of Mr. Basil Fernandez was that he had junior minister experience in government. And he was able to, to make the strategy for eventually, I think um, perhaps one or two years later, putting a proposition to NRDC. So we got five million pounds <coughs> funding, which started to deal with that end of the, of the paying for what we had determined we had to do. And now you'll, you'll hear how everybody else does it to the forest.
my memory is a bit like computer memories of the 60s. It's not exactly perfect. And if some of you have different recollections, I'm sure you'll have an opportunity in the discussion later uh, to correct me and perhaps other speakers and what we believe to be correct. In the early 60s, Ferranti had a number of computer designs developed independently by different divisions and indeed by groups within divisions. And these covered machine tool control, various military systems, and airline seat reservation, and numerous general purpose machines. Uh, these latter included Pegasus and Mercury from the late 50s, Atlas and Sirius from 61, and Orion and the FP6000 from 63, and the last name, as you know, came from the Ferranti Packard, uh, the Ferranti subsidiary in, in Canada. Uh, several of us in Ferranti at that time felt perhaps that the Ferranti family were really running a charitable, charitable institution to enable budding computer designers to let their uh, hair down and do things. Uh, we didn't quite see at that time to have the full marketing implications of things. Uh, but in 1963, Ferranti had a uh, perceived marketing need uh, for the UK and its small export, export market uh, for a system uh, that could follow on from the medium price in the medium price range and a follow-on to the reasonably successful uh, Pegasus, Mercury, and Sirius machines. Some preliminary specification work had been done uh, in the UK by Harry Johnson on the sales side, and the researchers, John Eilis and others, were having ideas of things like the basic language machine. However, what was lacking uh, was a sense of urgency that was needed to produce a system quickly. And just before this time, uh, a party from Ferenti Packard, Fred Longstaff and others, had come to the UK to see the Ferenti UK uh, ideas, including features of Orion. And after a fairly lengthy visit in the UK, they returned to Canada, and helped by some recruits they found from the UK on the way, <coughs> they set to and designed and produced in quick time the FP6000 using engineering techniques already proven in their seat reservation system. The first FP6000 was installed and running in March 63 at the US Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And this was probably two years ahead of any other project that the UK could initiate. Uh, this success with the FP6000 prompted a visit to Canada by uh, a team from the UK, myself and Derek Erwin and some others. And <coughs> we were there to study all aspects of the FP6000, its design, its programming uh, to date, its availability of stuff software and so on, and maintenance and installation problems, with a view to assessing the system suitability with some modification if necessary uh, for manufacture and marketing in the UK. On our return in March 63, we wrote, wrote a report. I see a copy is available for anyone to study there. And having written it, I think it's not a bad report to, uh, to read over the years. And uh, <coughs> we certainly recommended that Ferranti UK should adopt the FP6000 as its ongoing system. One paragraph from the report summarizes our findings. We said, there are certain facets of the system we do not like. However, were we to begin designing now a machine in the same price performance range as the FP6000, we would have in some 18 months' time a system that would not be significantly better, if indeed it were any better, than the FP6000 itself. Uh, and of course, I think knowledge now that I, that I hadn't thought at that time that the machine was also of significance in any discussions that were going on between uh, Ferranti and ICT. Uh, very soon after the publication of the report, there was a visit to, the, to New York and Toronto by a joint uh, Ferranti ICL, ICT team, which uh, Arthur has referred to. And the 
can be little doubt, as Arthur said, that the ICT representatives were quite impressed with what they saw. And if Arthur would allow me to tell a little story about that visit, uh, I think it sums up the fact that we on the Parenti side bought the FP6001. I remember meeting Peter Hall at Heathrow before we set off on this visit, the travel arrangements having, made by, having been made by ICT, and Peter was wondering whether we would be traveling out first class or economy. I think Peter, as a Parenti director, was probably used to first class travel. However, when Arthur and Tom Shepard arrived, uh, we travelled economy. Nothing wrong with that, it was a very pleasant journey out. But when we returned to New York from Toronto, uh, Arthur's, one of Arthur Humphrey's first actions in going to the ICT office in New York was a get, get a secretary to upgrade our return tickets to first class. And I felt that summed up the visit, and then I felt confident the FP6000 would indeed picture in ICT's future plan. <laughs> uh, the FP6000 with new software and peripherals became the Parenti uh, ICT 1900 ahead of the range, and of course later it became the 1904 in the range. <coughs> Sorry, I'm tossing space. And of course, as Derek Elder will say in a moment, through the ingenuity of UK computer designers, ways were found to produce larger and smaller versions, and the whole became the 1900 series. So I'll kindly hand over to Derek and take the story a little further. Um, you may or may not know what that means. It's named 
up for the solid logic technology uh, which they had developed for what was to become the 360 series. Um, but I missed the atmosphere of Ferranti, uh, including the inventiveness of the people and being closer to the center of things. And I'd be able to very large organization. But before rejoining Ferranti, I felt that I needed reassurance that the rumored merger with ICT, sorry, it was rumored, <laughs> um, probably somebody had stamped the document top secret, which is, as we know today, the best way of making sure that it's widely publicized. Uh, I need reassurance that this merger uh, was actually going to take place. Uh, and Hugh Devonall and uh, Peter Hunt, who were running Lily Hill at that time, were able to get me that assurance. Um, I now know from what's already been transpired that I was at eight, where that assurance came from, well, I knew that at the time. Very miles away there, the arms forward at the front. Um, but I didn't realize why he was able, in confidence, to uh, give that reassurance uh, indirectly. Um, he was the main protagonist, <laughs> I guess, uh, behind wanting the murder to happen. Now, it wasn't just a question of concern that I had for the viability of Ferranti, um, though, as already been alluded, many people have said, and I'm sure this comes from Arthur. Uh, their motto of first into the future um, in today's publicly quoted companies will probably be translated as first into the red. I'm sure you said something about that. Um, it was that IBM was about to make a major gamble <coughs> aimed at replacing virtually all their computers with a new compatible range. I'd like to stress this gamble to buy the new in a, in a new range. If they succeeded, <coughs> their competitors would require an imaginative response, which I had every confidence would be devised. Financial strength and marketing muscle, and Peter Ellis has excellently described uh, ICT's capability in that respect at that time. Only the first of these, the imaginative response, was probably assured within Ferranti, and I assume that we all were a similar mind at the time as to why we believe that merger was necessary. The concept of a compatible range seems obvious now, um, but it wasn't then. Uh, Peter has mentioned that um, it was a good, I think, believe in the art, I mean, it was a, an objective about how the, you know, we hope to have one day. And indeed, I spoke to somebody who's not here, a small indirect part of it, uh, Ted Brown was on Sunday, um, and asked the question to him, you know, uh, was there any talk of a, of a compatible range within Ferranti at that time? This is we're talking about sort of summer of 62 now. Um, he said, well, yes, I had the idea uh, as well, that I'd like to have had it, but I realized that it was an unrealistic objective. Um, all these people inventing uh, machines all around the place and, and, and buying for attention. So it isn't, it wasn't as obvious then as it now seems. The development, launch, and marketing of just one new machine at a time was a formidable enough venture. You would have got some of the figures that Peter put up on the thing to realize that. You know, they really, really was a major investment. And even large car manufacturers, let's reflect, today take this approach, one machine at a time. I mean, the idea that they would say, all our Fords are now obsolete, we've now got this new galactic range, uh, which is going to replace the lot. Uh, and of course, we know that you won't buy any of our existing machines anymore, and we, you know that we can't deliver these machines for another two or three years, the new cars or whatever. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, we're telling you we're going to do this and taking this huge gamble financially and in every other way. 
So consequently, um, while they couldn't take the risk of oscillating all their existing models in one go, um, IBM decided that they would. Uh, and it was such a, a gamble uh, that I didn't find it very easy to convince people that a response within ICT with a compatible range was necessary. I mean, people like Peter didn't need convincing that it would be desirable, but it was necessary uh, and urgent that we didn't have very much time. Now, why was it, in fact, that IBM took this enormous burden? I wasn't at the center of things in IBM, um, and I, so to some extent I had to sort of speculate. Um, but from the conversations that I had then and uh, <coughs> since, I um, have to highlight two things. Few people, I think, and I include myself amongst these, have contemplated the enormous burden that software development would become. I mean, you know, in those days, um, oh, we'll need a code board compiler, of course, and we'll be an algorithm compiler, you know, for the scientific chatting, so uh, that was software, and they were born of our class. But the enormous cost, and uh, Peter Hunt will tell us much more about later on. <coughs> Uh, that was going to be incurred in supporting a, a range of machines in an evidently enormous expanding market that just hadn't been contemplated. And the other thing was, and this is where I think I get very far seeing, the huge investment that customers were beginning to make in the programs, their programs, in which they would want to preserve. Um, it was so difficult to write programs with some of those some of those early machines, you know, with hardly any storage and, and the like. Um, but the idea of sort of preserving it for prosperity and building it up as, a, 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 as an asset, a company asset, which, you know, eventually would become something you just could not, uh, had not occurred to anybody. Um, but IBM had realized this, these two things were crucial for the long-term future. And that was the reason that they took the gamble. But it was a gamble. They did just what I've said, no, no sensible car company would do. Obviously, the entire range with an announcement would be one announcement, as we shall see in a moment. Uh, even uh, three rather more surprising aspects of that. So we had to act quickly, or so I believe. Uh, and to do this, we needed a machine that was in production, or at least close to it, and which could form the basis of a range. There simply wasn't time for a new range, though as Hugh has said, there were a number, and Peter has said, there were a number of teams within Parenti, RCA, RCA, and ICT as well, who were looking for the ultimate solution, uh, that order code which would outlast every other uh, and, and become uh, the lingua franca. So, the urgency of a response. The ability to deliver proven hardware quickly was important, and this was probably the key factor which ultimately led to the selection of the FP6000 as the basis of the range. And incidentally, I believe, uh, uh, it's been confirmed by what already been said, probably hasten the ICT anti merger. The circuits that were actually chosen uh, had a good, a, a long lineage, surprisingly enough, although they were fairly advanced at uh, that time. They originally developed uh, in Willenshaw by one uh, Morris Gribble, uh, Peter, and uh, in a good variety manner were christened Griblons, well, um, Griblons thereafter. Uh, and they were the circuits that were used in a number of projects and uh, were picked up for Orion 2, which was an urgent project in Parantia at the time, and uh, therefore well 
this evidence by the time Randy Packard uh, chose that was the basis of the AFB 6000. In the event, uh, this choice enabled the 1900 series to be announced in September 64, only, nine, only six months after the 360 series <coughs> itself. And in fact, it was delivered in fact, earlier than IBM was range in many cases, particularly in the UK. Although we started late, we actually arrived a bit early. Thank you. 
to the FP6000, which I don't, quite, don't need to bother about because that, that again has already been mentioned, but the, um, the main one really came down in the end to should we have a copy of the IBM uh, range or not via RCA, um, and it was rejected for marketing reasons. We did have a major bit of luck. In the event, that bit of luck was that IBM announced their system as expected in March 64, but with extremely long delivery periods. Um, that gave us a delivery advantage, as well as the cost advantage, the other important point, inherent in a six-bit design based on proven hardware. They, of course, had the eight-bit bike. It was a major success, I believe, of the range that compatibility and enhanceability uh, was achieved and rigorously adhered to. Um, I, I really, in, in even in retrospect, find that amazing that we did lay it down and it actually happened. I mean, with this group of bunch of people around, you can't imagine that, how difficult it must have been. Finally, it was an Achilles heel. Uh, some features of the 1900 series, such as I've mentioned, such as the six-bit characters, helped us greatly to achieve the competitive costs, but eventually were unable to meet growing communication and storage needs. So a new range had to come. But nevertheless, with direct machine emulation introduced to the new range. Mark, did it you to uh, the video of Explorer? Is it going to talk to us about the interesting uh, topics of keeping the 1900 uh, range competitive? Thank you. Right. I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of the initial 1900 range, how it evolved during the 10 years of its active market life after 1974 and how it related to competition during that time. I will look at it from a product planning point of view. Uh, between 64 and 69, I was in product planning with crucial processes and systems. And therefore, I will look at it very much at that sort of level of detail. And as business later, I will pick it up from the technical and architectural detail. Before starting that, I would like just to recall the sort of environment of the time. ICP, when it made the decision of the 1900 range, really faced a very, very significant challenge from the development planning point. It had to develop all its systems in-house. No way anybody else could actually give us a 1900 system. The hardware and the software had to be developed in-house with the resources we had. And the span of the range, as Derek has said, more, more or less decided. RCT, at the time, I think, was number one in the UK. Probably the only country in the world, the UK, where IBM was not the dominant system. And therefore, in order to maintain market credibility and avoid losing market share, RCD had to somehow offer a range that was roughly comparable, 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 sorry, with an IBM range. But of course, as Peter Ellis just said, the IBM R&D spend was probably larger than our total revenue. The other factors to take into consideration is that ICT had acquired the EMI, had boosted its development resources, computer development resources, with the EMI computer expertise and the Ferranti computer department. Very good skills in West Gordon, people like Charlie Portman, Gordon Harry, Chris Burton, Keith Acker and all their teams from the around and Atlas. In Stevenage, 
Michael Forrest, eh, Bill Corbett, Norman Brown, Ron Feather, and all the teams, all their teams. So there were considerable skilled expertise. But we had never actually met each other by the time we started. And we, we just didn't know each other. And that's why we didn't share a common system outlook or never mind a common method development methodology. Well, having been involved from the start, as I have said in the detail, I can say with some confidence that the initial 1900 range did not suffer from the many years of careful planning of the ABM 360s. We <laughs> were in a hell of a rush. ABM left the market opportunity open with their long delivery and we really moved very fast to capture that opportunity. And as Derek said, in six months after the IBM announcement, we were able to announce seven 1900 models, 18 peripherals, and a bunch of software, and demonstrate all the models at Olympia. And in fact, we delivered in the April, I think April or May 1965, the year after. From the competitive point of view, looking at the positioning of the range in terms of performance, commercial performance, between ACL and ABM, ACT and ABM, sorry, at the beginning, We can see that in 1966, when the two ranges had settled down, ICT with the 1900 could match very well the IBM 360 in the middle <coughs> and bottom of the range. In fact, with the introduction of the 1901, one year after the initial announcement, was switching in the market, parts of the market that the 360 could not reach. Uh, the IBM, the ICT 1900 at the time was projected on the value for money platform in the market. And uh, for planning purpose, we used to assume a pricing of 5% below the IBM Cost performance, uh, price performance curve. So it was very competitive, but we thought we had a bit of a problem at the top. The R1900 was a simple architecture and could not reach the commercial performance of the top of the IBM range. And that was a consideration that we were very much aware of and drove our system toward multiprocessors and eventually it was one of the factors that took us into a new range. When I look at how the 1900 compete, uh, did compete in the 10 years of its life, take into account the difference in resources developed between, how, uh, between us and IPM. I really find it very hard to believe. It in fact, it reminds me of a conversation I was having with one of these business gurus at a conference some time way past. And I asked him what he thought of my company. And he said, well, your company, just like a bumblebee, according to theory, shouldn't be able to fly like it does. <laughs> Well, by 1974, ICT, or ICRS then was, had expanded the 1900 range very significantly, and the range with the 1906, with the S series and the T series, that was very much state of the art technology, 
very good wrestling competitively. And all that was done with the resources that, you know, very small resources. Furthermore, has managed to introduce in, in 73 a 20 nano three that was introduced there to counteract the system tree that, that appeared below. Uh, the entry the seven as it then was. And furthermore, was in developing three models of a new range of that from those resources. To say, it's very difficult to believe that such a thing could be achieved. In fact, I think if we applied modern management techniques to it, we'll probably conclude that it wasn't possible, so we wouldn't bother. <laughs> I would like to just look with you at some of the factors that I thought from my position as a planning man, a product planning man, some of the factors that I thought were important for achieving this, this type of performance. Speed of implementation. We used to do things really very fast in those days. And the 1900 architecture was very open, very easy to modify. It was actually blessed by accepting. It was a piece of software between the hardware and software and the rest of the software, developed by a team with the hardware people. And it used to present a compatible interface to the rest of the software. That enabled us to decouple hardware and software development and to change the hardware without a lot of uh, prop propagate the changes up in the software. That was very important. And of course, range compatibility. We enforce range compatibility very, very strongly. There was a compatibility committee chaired by Bruce Patterson who really was making sure that compatibility <coughs> would not be breached. And uh, many times during my planning activities, there was the opportunity to change the order code to get it better. After all, we all come to run and change the order code. It was really our way of life. But we never did it, even if the product would not be as good as we could make it. Range compatibility was really very, very strong. Another advantage of executive, by the way, that uh, I need to mention was that w we could actually deliver machines with executive without having to wait for the operating system. When we started in 64, we were planning to deliver machines in 65. No way we could get the George 3 in that time. Operating systems took some time. So we could deliver with executive. And that was a tremendous advantage. Now, we able to do that, they had to wait for the operating system to run into trouble. Modularity. The standard interface was the key component of modularity. The ICT standard interface that was actually developed by Ron Freda and Stevenage, I believe. And, of course, standard as peripheral standard interfaces were not new at the time. They were known. I came across my first manifestation of the ICT stand, of a standard interface, or a peripheral standard interface, in Ferranti, when I was working on the around peripheral subsystem. And Peter Hall, the manager of the Ferranti computer department, insisted that the Atlas and Orion Tech Dex should have the same interface, and had concept. Really, most unreasonable. However, <laughs> this standard interface was exploited not just in, but in, in the market, in the market, and it was brilliantly exploited by ICT in the market. But from development as well, we were able to de decouple all sorts of development and bring it all together at the end. Other interfaces developed, for instance, the processor store interface in the upper sub range. And they were all propagated and eventually need help us a lot 
in achieving very fast uh, deliveries. Rapid application of technology. We, of course, we were not manufacturing our component technology. We had people who scattered the world and got us the best uh, technology they could get, state-of-the-art technology. And our developers became really skilled in applying that very quickly and in intercepting trends. We will see that in a moment. Besides those four technical factors, <coughs> there were three organizational factors that I think I must mention because they made uh, our job so much easier. We started by not knowing each other in the So the first machine we had to plan after the initial 1900, that was the 1901, we adopted working parties for the world. Uh, the 1901 working party, we called together all the interest in the company that uh, were to contribute to that. I remember Der Gerdy was the chairman, I was the secretary, and Bill Torbo was the Stephen H. representative and he made a tremendous contribution. And we debated the thing, and eventually we arrived at a great proposal that we all believed could be done, the resources were in place, the development costs could, could be done, etc. We all wrote it down, and the, it was put up as a development proposal to the development committee, that was the final authority. Uh, one week before the meeting, the, the development committee was meeting about one every 176 weeks. And after the meeting, Tom Shepard used to rush down, he was the secretary of the development committee, he briefed us, okay, this is a tool. And uh, no hesitation, we knew exactly where we stood. All I needed to do is to make a few phone calls to West Gordon team and try this a tool, off you go. And the project really were well, already fully understood full commitment in all the units involved, and really had a running start. That was a tremendous achievement, and very soon we all got to know each other very well. And the focus of development, because of resource constraint, we had to concentrate on the things that were just 1900 specific, and we started withdrawing from all the things that we could actually buy from outside. But I think that was, <coughs> Some of the factors, no doubt, some more will come during the day that help us in achieving such remarkable development performance. And I still, looking back, I cannot quite believe that it was like that, that we actually did. When I started planning the, this seminar, I thought it would be a good idea to have a 1900 roadmap, putting down all the 1900 system models ever produced, days, performance, etc., etc. So we did that. In courtesy of Brown Proctor, I have here a color slide of it. Now, I'm not going to talk about it. It's far too complicated, and therefore you know, uh, it will take too long. I'm putting it up simply to give you a visual image of the how the 1900 actually developed over between the period 65, 75, 80. I will extract from it some of the key dates and just talk at it from the planning point of view rather than try to go to such a complete static chart. From the marketing point of view, the 1900 had three major phases. The initial announcement that we had, of, the A series announcement, and the S series announcement, with three, three and a half years between each other. A life of the range was about three to three and a half years before you need to replace it with replacement models. Then there was a set of T enhancement, tactical enhancement towards the end. By the way, 29th of January 68, 1,000 orders taken, just to give you an idea of the sort of quantities we are talking about. Well, just from 
from the marketing point of view, from the development point of view, I think there were really two phases in the 1900 development. The first one was the, what I call the architectural phase. We had a 1900 architecture that not quite understood. And during the first phase, we took it, uh, our developers took it up, down, see what we can do, change, modify it, etc. Till we came out on the first phase with a really solid, well understood architecture and some template design that we could do with confidence. And then we moved into the second phase that was to apply technology, advanced technology, very aggressively to that stable architecture so that we did not have to change the architecture any longer, we only run the technological risk. The first phase, just to have a look. The sort of thing we developed in the first phase. After the initial range, the seven models announced, as I said, we had to, the first thing we did, to design in 1901, to de define in 1901. But the working party, the conventional wisdom at the time was that in order to go into that type of market, you had to have complex character handling your instruction for because it was replacing calculators. And of course, the 1900 did not have any. But we proceeded anyway, and 1901 was really a very good machine, a very successful machine, done in steerage. In fact, it was so successful that we say, well, let's have another part of the argument. Let's go down another step the market, and we assembled a working party, we started planning a below 1900 machine. And again, it could be done, it could be manufactured for the right cost, etc. You know, the working party was all agreed. Uh, it even had an, an interrogating typewriter to have online queries, a very advanced concept in those days. Uh, however, when we looked at the sales cost, assuming a reasonable hit rate, it just was not profitable with those sales costs. So we dropped it without even putting it to the development committee. And from then on, the 1901 became the effective lower limit of the range. And we revisited this area only in 1973 with the 2903. Another Uh, side way, we took the 1904 design, and we did all sorts of things to it, or Charlie did, I should say. Uh, we applied microprogramming, we uh, extended all that code, etc., and even put a uh, paging, segmentation and paging on it as an option, supported by uh, the George Foa operating system. I remember calling in Frank Sumner from Manchester University, the Atlas experience, to help us to put this, uh, uh, this facility in. But we did it all, and eventually we ended up with a fairly stout, stable, and good template for the architecture. In fact, it was so good that we said, well, let's take two of them together, because we want to go higher in the range. Let's put two of them together, make it a dual. The operating system can show you all the work so the customer can use it without knowing which machine to use. And the project is a new model. And we did that with the 670F. And uh, again, gave us valuable expertise on the. Uh, and in fact, we were so happy with it that we went into to design an android. That was the time of the supercomputer. I don't know if you remember. Project 51, Project 52, the three white men, and all that. So we made our proposal, four machines together, sharing a common store, and the reasonable type of machine. We, however, of course, were taken by a van, so we did not.
Uh, so we went into the second phase. I'm sure that will be covered by other speakers. What I want to say is that by that time, we had a clear understanding of what atoms in the architecture would, we were unable to correct, and therefore what atoms would necessitate changing by introducing a new range on the long term. Nothing wrong with the short term, but on the long term, we had to introduce a new range because those atoms eventually would not go anywhere. But of course, we were not trained here. We had four teams capable of developing four systems in parallel, and uh, the development time was roughly the same time as the life of the system in the market. So we had to keep running to keep still and to keep those machines competitive, applying advanced technology to each other. Here we say, well, you understand modularity, we understand the technology trend. So when we sat down designing the A series in 1966, 67, we said, well, let's design it in such a way that modules can be replaced when the technology becomes available, and uh, so that we, we give a B series without having to do all the volume all over again. That will free the resources to actually do something else. And we did that. Uh, in fact, from four machines, we derived all the products from the known. And 6A to 6S with a faster store, 4A, 4S, etc. It really worked really nicely. And we were able to take the resources and take them, some, at least some of them, into other projects. The 29034 and the new machine. Of course, by then, the merger with English Electric had happened, and therefore the requirement for a new range had required great urgency, and the requirement for a more complex new range was really coming to the fore. However, that is another story, so I will stop here. Trying to get the um, 
ICL standard interface onto the 2201. Uh, looking back on this, I realized that my concern with computer technology was rather overshadowed by two other elements of technology, one of which was at least computer related, which was the Bryant fixed disk, which um, terrified everybody at West Gordon for fear it might break loose in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, the other thing that struck me about technology at the time was flying up and down between Philadelphia, Washington, and Miami in electrics, which were famous for the characteristic of the turbo crops coming off and spearing passengers in certain rows in the, in the cabin. You could always lie out along those rows without fear of anybody else wanting to use them. It's a very useful thing. Um, and I guess that the other thing I remember about Park Beach basically was um, Dickie Bird and the butterflies and the alligators. So I thought, although it comes from a different um, continent, I would just put that up to a straight point. <laughs>
some point, as I say in 63, I became head of that, um, on a quick count, that put me reporting to Echo Organ, who thereby became my seventh different boss in as many years. A further quick count suggests that I changed bosses once a year for almost the rest of my career. Why some of those bosses didn't realize the likely consequence of having me as their subordinate, I'm not quite sure. Now, in the run-up to the 1900s at Stevenage, we had very much there been involved in putting the standard interface onto a derivative of the 1301, called the 1302. That machine was, in fact, not only developed, given a type number, but was sold and was delivered. But I think looking at, in retrospect, its role as a test bed for the standard interface, and therefore for the peripherals attached to it through the standard interface, must be enormously more important than its actual revenue earning role, even at the Department of Works or whatever it was called, the tasting. I certainly remember having to go to in order to placate the customer. Indeed, my perception is that the standard interface was a really very important element in the 1900 series. That's been referred to already by Peter and Derek, um, and you, I think. I think, in fact, you can trace a succession from that standard interface through the various communications standards that followed, and even in a sense, through Unix to the, perhaps more by accident than intention, compatible PC. The idea that you should try to make things easy for both the designer and the manufacturer on the one hand, and the customer on the other hand, with the same act, was probably pioneered by that standard interface, which in, in truth should be called, I think, the RCA ICT, or at least ICT, RCA, Standard Interface. Though there's no doubt it was their intention to use it as well. Uh, if you look at, however, the, the history of the Standard Interface on the early 1900s, in practical terms, there was a downside, which was, as Arthur referred to, some of the early machines went to distant parts, Brisbane in particular. Um, but what was curious was that all those systems, the further away they were going, more exotic combination of peripherals seemed to have got ordered. <laughs> I think there's a logical explanation, which was that to sell a 1900 that far away was more difficult than to sell it in the UK, so you had to exploit the whole catalogue as hard as you could. The consequence for the developers was um, somewhat frightening. Now, as has been indicated several times, the 1902 and 1903 processor, which were really the same design with different cost of speed, were allocated to Stevenage. And I think at that point, one should say that three things had already been fixed. Standard interface, the order code, and the circuitry of the processor. There is a sample of um, the 700 series circuits over there, and as good as my memory is, that looks exactly what they were. And I think that it was absolutely key to what happened at Stevenage, and the speed with which it happened, and the relative I think even at the time it was obvious, lack of hassle that was involved in doing those developments, that those three things were fixed absolutely. It stopped the hardware engineers in their tracks from reinventing everything every third Thursday. And it stopped the general, I have to say perhaps, general computer industry habit in those days of trying to be clever in every possible manifestation of every possible feature of the system, both hardware and software. There was, of course, another side to this, which was that there were a lot of innovative people who, when faced with these three constraints, became
became initially very resistant and quite demotivated. I personally take the view that the very shortness of the development timetable available was the thing that rescued the operation from the downside of those constraints. Because it dawned on people quite quickly that the constraints and the very tight time scale were in fact two sides of the same coin. And that only with those constraints could the time scale be met. And just to give an example of the tendency of people to be clever, one of the proposals that was made for limiting the costs of the 1902-3 processor was that where diodes on the gate circuits are not actually used in the particular instances of the board positions, when we got into full production, the unused diodes would be omitted so that every card potentially was different. But of course, spares were provided with one with all the diodes in. Extremely fortunately, common sense intervened before one of the biggest logistic cock-ups I could ever imagine <laughs> had time to happen. But it's certainly that recollection gels with the issue about the costs of the small machines. How do you <laughs> extrapolate downwards and get a reasonable scaling of cost? And it's quite important to remember, I think, at this period in time, that the unit cost of hardware was not falling at that time in anything like the speed that we have become accustomed to in the PC, Spark, and all those years. It was pretty static at that time. And the other thing that's worth remembering has been touched on, is that at that time, the software people, programmers, were just starting to understand how to spend really big money. <laughs> so the hardware people had to do two things. They had to do more for less, and they had to do it in a much more standard manner, so that the software people didn't bankrupt the company. And as we hardware people, as I then was, felt could be paid twice as much as us. The hardware people, I think, genuinely did try help the software people. Sometimes the hardware people wondered, I think, why the software people didn't try to help themselves more. However, in this distinguished um, company, I won't carry on. <laughs> um, aside, therefore, from the constraints, what also made the process of getting things going in Stevenage uh, possible? I was going to say easy, but that's rubbish. Possible. Well, I guess there were two things. One was the EMI team, which demonstrated how to work together almost by transfers in a way that I had personally never seen before, and I doubt will ever quite the same be seen again. In a sense, you could say cynically that nothing concentrates the mind more than having your pet project cancelled under you at a very short notice. You have people who want to do something. They moved remarkably quickly onto it at Stevenage, and all credit to them. They certainly, and the way they behaved in those circumstances, were a key element. But also, I think, the way in which Stevenage was told to get on with it had quite an important contribution to make in this regard. I remember, and here I have problems with the date, because whenever I put this in, it doesn't quite fit with some of the evidence. The only thing is I absolutely know it happened. Um, both the processor and the peripheral people were called into the canteen and stage and effectively told, this is what you're going to do. It's going to be a 1900 range. These are the givens. And Echo Organ spent about five minutes doing that and then said, get on with it looking at um, Bill Talbot, Norman Brown, and me, and one or two others standing around. I must say, in retrospect, it felt a bit like that. But... 
Now, let's return a bit to the constraints. Basically, the standard interface said something very important. It said that if that peripheral works on the 1302, then if it doesn't work on the 1303, or doesn't work on the 45 or whatever, the 1902-3 or the 1904-5 had better be changed. Now, that wasn't quite as draconian as it sounded, because what you actually went to change was executive. And it's been mentioned that there's no doubt that the existence of the executive on the 1900s made a development possible that otherwise could not have been done in that period of time. There was an adapter in the middle that allowed both parties' hardware mistakes to be smoothed over and stuck together. <coughs> but the, the manner of the announcement also convinced me of something else. Because if we had settled back and tried to calculate how long we really need to do the job, I'm sure we'd have come up with a calculation <coughs> which would not have satisfied Peter Ellis' time scale, to say at least, let alone others. Um, and I, in a sense, believe this as a result of that exchange. Now, Cardinal Newman might not have known too much about the IT industry when he wrote that, but there was no doubt it was the words that made the people do it, not the logic of how long it really ought to take. So, the standard interface, in a sense, disciplined both the processor people and the peripheral people. And although I was in charge of the processor people at Stevenage and not in charge of the peripheral people, despite, regrettably, having designed the um, photoelectric optic, optics for two of the card readers, which, in fact, nobody ever forgot afterwards, um, it was, in fact, the peripherals that occupied the vast proportion of my personal time and probably of the management's anguish. We certainly were still learning there. Even the, con the conventional peripherals like card readers were, what should we say, right at the limit of the physical capability of the medium. And nothing is as effective in teaching self-control and also the cussedness of of inanimate objects as a card, a high speed card reader that has chucked all the cards all over the floor. One of the things we learned from Ferranti quite early on was it was a good idea to have the executive on paper tape, which could only get snagged and could be repaired with sticky tape rather than on cards, which if the whole lot were dropped on the floor, it would take you two hours to sort them out again, and even then there would be one. But obviously, the common audit code was a key issue as well. It created a situation, basically, where if the 1902-3 didn't run a program the same way as 1904-A and FB6000 did, then you knew which half had to be changed. <coughs> Just like the standard interface, you had a preset set of rules to tell you what was the mask and what was the product that the mask has to produce. You knew which to change. And getting executive was often a thing that was actually changed to fix a problem of that sort. I particularly remember, incidentally, um, our experiences with mag magnetic tape. Uh, at Stevenage, we used Potter tape decks and CDC tape decks. CDC tape decks, not from Minneapolis, but from Paris, a country at the moment. But perhaps the most striking characteristic was the personalities of our two interfaces in that <laughs> organization. Um, the Potter sales manager or sales director, I remember on a trip that Arthur and I made, which ended up in Puerto Rico, where um, Potter had set up a factory consisted, among other things, of said sales director sitting on the arm of Arthur's plane seat and making both of them excruciatingly uncomfortable throughout the whole journey. Why said person in Potter thought this was a good sales technique, I couldn't work out. 
Um, I also remember that that was very that journey was very um, good at training a junior manager in the correct way to behave when he and his managing director had played in the same casino. And he had made what seemed to me to be an enormous sum of money. To my horror, I discovered I'd lost almost exactly the same amount. <laughs> it became rapidly clear that there was no contract between me and my managing director, only separately between me and the casino management and him and the casino management. The CDC tech decks had mechanical tape buffer arms. It didn't take anybody who could write a sort program or less long to exploit the resonances in these to bring them to a dead stop <laughs> with the tape all over the floor. Um, our contact there, his name was Oscar Citrine. <coughs> to my amazement, amongst my personnel records, I find I have a letter from him in French inviting my wife and I to go and spend New Year's Eve with him in his apartment. Um, that was a marvelous occasion, but I can assure you that the tape decks didn't somehow live up to that experience. Now, quite obviously, at some point, and I can't be exactly sure when, the fixed date of the Olympia Business Efficiency Exhibition descended upon us as something that had to be met. It wasn't quite as clear cut as one might think. I believe there were several weeks of argument as to whether it was possible or not. I certainly possess a letter from Echo Organ which says, you get on with it, West Gordon is still arguing, as I suggested. But once it was said, we really did have to meet that date. I don't think anybody at Stephen H. really contemplated not meeting it. Quite why we met it, it is impossible for me to work out, because logically, even now, it seems slightly impossible to have done. I do remember long hours, I do remember moving from my home to a hotel in Stevenage so that I could be called in at short notice. I also remember that the engineers, obviously making the right judgment about management, never did actually call me in from the hotel. And because the Stevenage <coughs> the main exchange in those days was manual, in order they could, one of the outside lines was plugged through to me in my um, hotel room, and I took five bookings from the hotel throughout the night. I was never called in to do anything. <laughs> I'm quite sure that, that by keeping out of the way, I allowed the process of people to get on with it, and I actually put my main effort trying to get peripherals from my colleague, you see me, from my colleague across the secretary's office, Brian Maudsley, to get peripherals to meet the requirements on 1392. So, maybe I didn't actually contribute at all to the process. Maybe that is the real secret of that success. <coughs> now, I do realize that business efficiency exhibition, important as it was, was probably in no sense halfway to getting the first customer in the business. The subsequent production, introduction, and manufacturing process was actually very much more fraught than the development process. And somehow or other, we got ourselves through that. There was at least one scurrilous item in the an ICL anthology book about my behavior in the middle of the night with the line printer, which I can assure you is all completely untrue. But we did, <coughs> as Arthur said, the first ones actually went to Australia. I think at this point, point in time, I certainly remember the ones that did go to Australia. I've not mentioned the 1901 because in reality, that emerged after I'd left Seagnage. Um, somebody pushed me via manufacturing into sales, and when I was in sales, there was an interesting sting in the tail as far as I was concerned, which was that I was selling to universities and research organizations, and 
and later, where of course 1900 was in competition with System 4 and System 4's predecessors, when I moved into planning, I went to visit one of these research organizations, and instead of drawing their wisdom about what might be applied to ICL's future products, I received an hour's tirade for having been such an incompetent salesman that I'd allowed them by failing to reject the merits of Trent 1900 to buy a system for, and now look at all the problems they have. <laughs> now, I did actually undertake this Gilles request with some reluctance. I believe that looking back, to create some real problems of acknowledging whose contributions were key. I am very conscious of the fact that this talk does no justice to such. But I will mention two names, neither of whom are with us at all now. <coughs> They're dead, Bill Torbett and Ron Fenner. I believe those two names are very important in the history of this. Other than that, I think the only thing I can put up is that. <laughs>